Good afternoon, guys, and welcome to episode 67 of Costa Rica Real Estate and Investments with me, your host, Richard Bexon. Today, we're going to be talking with Michelle Bruton. She's an architect and also interior designer of Atelier Vert. It's a sustainable design and architecture company. But before we do that, just want to shout out to everyone that's reached out to me. I'm actually helping quite a few of you that have listened to the podcast, which is great. Just had a couple who had spent six months trying to find land in the southern zone of Costa Rica, um, contracted me to find it. And basically, within 24 hours, I'd found the land from them after speaking to local farmers. So, uh, you know, I usually go a little bit off the reservation sometimes, guys, um, which again, sometimes is, you know, well, I wouldn't say sometimes, the majority of the time, uh, it turns up diamonds in the rough and you sometimes get to pay a little bit less than what you'd be paying, uh, of course, if you went through a realtor. But anyway, let's get, remember, actually, if you do want to reach out to me, you can do info at investingcostarica.com. That's info at investingcostarica.com. Uh, we had uh, one of our listeners the other day reach out uh, and request some stuff on financing, closing costs. So we're going to be in the future, probably within the next couple of podcasts covering those subjects. Okay. But as I mentioned today, we are meeting with Michelle Brutan, who is an interior designer and architect. Her and her team work on projects all over Costa Rica. Um, and today we're going to be focusing a little bit more on sustainable architecture, you know, with a focus on the Guanacaste area of Costa Rica, which is actually where she spends the majority of her time. I actually bumped into her in Nasada. Uh, she has huge knowledge in Playa Grande because her family owned one of the beachfront homes there in Grande for many, many years. Uh, and I know for anyone that listening in on this that has been to Grande uh, because of the podcast, they completely understand what it is that I'm talking about. So remember, if you have any questions for Michelle, all of her contact details will be in the description. But let's get straight into it, guys. Good afternoon, Michelle. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Very, very good. I really appreciate you taking the time. I know you guys are pretty busy uh, out there in the field of architecture at the moment, but I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for having me. No worries. Well, I mean, it's been a crazy two years, as I mentioned in all my podcasts, you know, and uh, I don't think it seems like it'll continue. I don't know whether the craziness is going to continue or stop or what's happening, but... <laughs> Thinking about the last six months specifically, Michelle, I mean, what, you know, what has surprised you, but also what trends are you seeing in your field? Okay, so what surprises me the most is how much the prices went up with the pandemic. Yep. Uh, but it's amazing, like lots that you could have bought maybe before 2020. Yep. Um, they're completely unbuyable for people who would have been able to buy them some time ago. So the price is just, it, it was insane because a lot of people who lived in big cities came down to live here, to live at the beach, to live like somewhere that they don't have to be cooped up in an apartment. Yep. So that hiked up all the prices of everything. And it's amazing. And then construction prices went up a lot as well. But I think that's mostly because of all the container issues that's been going on. Yep. So all the prices in construction went up as well. So that's like the most surprising thing is that it's so much, like the difference is so big. It's amazing. I was speaking to a construction guy. Um, I was this weekend, this week, actually, I was in, in Guanacaste with some guys from Minnesota and he works in construction. And he was like, well, how, I mean, how much a square foot is it here? I was like, I don't know, like 200, $250 a square foot. He was like, that's nothing. Like it's $500 a square foot in the US. So, you know, Costa Rica is still affordable to build. Yeah. You know, comparatively, it's crazy for us that's been down here where, you know, we remember <laughs> when it used to be like $80 a square foot or like $70 a square foot, you know, and, um, but, you know, when it's 500 and down here, it's 200, 250, you know, that doesn't sound too terrible. Yeah, I think it's mostly exactly like perspective for us who live here and who've seen the prices go up so much in such a short time. Yep. But yeah, I've also heard that about like people who have been buying houses, like already built houses. And they see the president, oh, it's not that expensive. But for me, like seeing the difference from what it was worth two years ago to what it's worth now, yep. it's just too much of a difference. It's too expensive. But you're completely correct. Like for people, some other places that are much more expensive to build and to buy homes, like it's not that expensive. Yeah. Well, you focus more on sustainable architecture and also design, which I think is interesting. But maybe you can just explain to like everyone that was listening here, you know, what does that mean? What specifically are the concepts you're incorporating? Will you try to incorporate in a project, you know, that you're working on? OK, so generally, like in general terms, sustainable design is just design that tries to impact the environment in the least way possible. So respecting what's already there, like sometimes 
um, what is really unsustainable is that you got you go and you buy a lot and it has like a huge cliff or something like that that and then you just want a flat house so you just kill everything on the lot and take out all the trees so you can have like your flat house that's unsustainable yep. so sustainability is mostly like respecting the site respecting nature and having a low impact on wherever you are when you're building your house so that goes from the design to also the construction process so there are different things that you can do during a construction process that makes it more sustainable also with material selections and finishes selections it's like now we have um, more products and more materials available everywhere yep. that are more sustainable, that have recycled content, that are from FSC certified trees, that like a lot of things that maybe like 10, 20 years ago, they weren't available for everybody. So sustainability was a concept that was thought of to be super expensive to do something sustainably because there were no things to do it with. Yeah. But right now there's a lot of things. There's a lot of opportunities to do that. And then you can do also a lot of passive design, which is what I like the most to incorporate in every project. Because you can also have like uh, the water treatment plants to reuse your water. You can have solar panels. You can have all of this, but these are like additional costs in construction. But if you have like a really good passive design, you may like not really need all that if you can't, invest in those things at the moment that you're building. Um, so if you have a really good passive design, you can reduce your electricity consumption, your AC, like you can use the AC only at night when you're closed in the house or whatever, like you can do things like that in a passive way, which is like what I really like to do most in all, in all of my projects, because some people, um, they come to me and they want a house and they don't really care so much about sustainability. So I yep. try to apply all of these other things that for them, it's not necessarily like doing something extra, but it's part of what I like to do, like incorporate in all of my projects. Give me an idea or give the listeners here a couple of ideas of like, what's your favorite stuff to incorporate into a project? Like if you, yeah, sure. if, if people just gave you a blank piece of paper and said like, do what you want. I mean, what stuff would you be incorporating? Okay, definitely natural light. Like for me, it's one of the most important things. And there's there have been a lot of studies, even like, for schools that have more natural light than artificial light, kids do better at school with that. So um, people function better in general and day-to-day -day things, like even if it's just your house, uh, if you have more natural light and less artificial light. So I do like to incorporate like really big windows and really good ventilation as well, because as you know, in Costa Rica, some like some months of the year, it's really, really, really hot. <laughs> So good ventilation is always important and good lighting. For me, those are like the two key things that are easy to do and don't require any additional things than good design. Just have a good design that incorporates those. I, I mean, I think that they're very basic but smart things that like people overlook. I mean, when you don't do this for a living, you have an idea of like what you want it to kind of look and feel like, but like from a functional point of view, um, you know, sometimes, I mean, that's why you use people like yourself, you know, but with large windows for light to come in, meaning also you don't spend as much money on electricity. Exactly. <laughs> you know, great ventilation. I saw a house the other day that had like, um, it was open at the top. It had like meshing around the top. So the hot air rose and then just kind of left. And like they had all the windows that being able to open all round, uh, you yeah. know, with mosquito netting if they needed it and stuff. But it was very yeah. interesting. You know, when they do that, like for the hot air to go up, Yep. that also like the action of the hot air going out pulls in fresh air from the bottom so there's a lot of like fresh wind coming into the house yeah like it moves the air because it's sucking in all the warmth out of the space so that's like an easy passive thing to do that makes a huge difference in a house yeah i mean i think the majority of people that are coming down here to buy a home or build a home don't really or maybe they do but like don't really understand the climates here in the different times of year you know because again october is completely different than march you know march is dry typically we get a lot of sun you know and sometimes the wind doesn't blow as much in march as well i mean usually easter of course it's absolutely deadly here because the wind doesn't blow and you know it's the hottest time of year uh whereas october we get tons of rain you know but do you deal on many houses that are capturing rainwater? Um, 
I always try to get my clients to want to do that, but that is like an additional investment to do that because you have to have uh, purification tanks yep. for the water if you want to use it again for the house and, and everything. So uh, I visited a project up in the mountains in Heredia, like maybe like three or three and a half hours away from San Jose. Yep. Um, and they did capture because it up there in the mountains and it rains all year long. Yep. So they did capture and they reused all of the rainwater, but then the house was lifted up like one floor over the over the ground. Yep. So under there, they had these huge tanks that had all the purification systems and everything in them. And I thought it was really amazing because I hadn't seen anything like that here in Costa Rica before. Yeah, yeah it's, that's interesting. I mean, could you just capture rainwater just to um, use it for your garden and use it for your toilets? Wow. You can do that, but then when it rains the most, True. you don't need water for your garden. So True. it's it's better to use it like to refill the tanks and the toilets that yeah. don't lead don't really need like drinkable water, but that's what what's used for the toilets normally. Yep. So with rainwater, that's a lot simpler to do. Like the purification system is a lot simpler to do that than when you do it with uh, uh like the treatment plant like for wastewater, because you can also do that. You can have a treatment plant for wastewater and then reuse it for the garden or for the toilet tanks. Uh, but then that's a bigger investment because it has to be a lot cleaner, the water, than the rainwater. So it, it has to go to, through a different process. But reusing water is one of the biggest things that you could do in Costa Rica, especially in the coastal areas, because I don't know if, if you've heard, like in most of the coastal towns, uh, getting permits to build a new house or a new project is really complicated right now because there's no water anyway. Yeah. yeah, they're not giving water letters out really, right? Exactly. So you need to to think of ways that you can reduce your water consumption like for drinkable water, which is what you need the permits and the letters for that they're not giving to anybody <laughs> right now. Like it takes a few months probably to get them. Michelle, people are always asking me, and maybe you know this and maybe you don't, about the difference between building via kind of like sheet concrete, you know, a steel frame with sheet concrete versus actual like, you know, concrete block. Do you have any preference or any advice for people? Okay. I actually like right now, one of the projects that I'm, uh, we're going to start building in a couple of months, uh, my clients are in between like doing one or doing the other because I, I well, a few years ago, I was building two houses at the same time yep. in the same area in Guanacaste, in Playa Grande, and one of them was doing concrete blocks, and the other one was doing the steel frame. Yep. And so we started comparing to see like if it really because the theory is that the steel frame is faster to build, so that it it, it becomes cheaper not because of the cost of the material but because of the length of the construction. But in these two projects, they took more or less the same time wow. to build both. And they were of a similar size. Um, one was slightly bigger, but it was not that much to make like a huge difference. Um, so I'm always like on the fence on which would be like better for the project. I personally prefer concrete blocks. <laughs> um, Mostly because I feel it's like acoustically and everything, it's different for the house. Yep. And also I feel like it's sometimes it's better for climate control inside yep. as well. Yep. Um, but I have worked with both and I really do like both. Uh, and the only difference I think in the end is that the construction time that yep. it takes. But some of them, some of the ones with the steel frame have styrofoam in them. Yep. So I don't really like those because of the styrofoam. Yeah, it's not exactly sustainable, is it? Exactly. It's not sustainable at all. It's like really fast to build, but it's not sustainable at all. Yeah. So those are the only ones that I try to steer my clients away from those. It's surprising you can still do that, Michelle, when styrofoam for like uh, food here, when you like take food home is illegal. You can't use it. I know, but you know, it's supposed to be illegal, but I've gotten things like from 
you you order Uber Eats from a restaurant and some yeah. people still send things in styrofoam containers. I like to think that they have like a, uh, they bought a lot of them and that's the only ones that they have left. That's yeah. all I like to think. But I am that's seeing a move towards, well. <laughs> yeah. I am seeing a move towards more sustainable kind of packaging for when you take uh, when you take food back. So that's good. Well, let's just quickly jump on Guanacaste then areas. I know this is an area that you work in. I know you're building some homes in this area. Um, I mean, and it's a big region, but I mean, what do you think people should understand about this area? What do you think, you know, what misconceptions do they have about Guanacaste that you think that they should be aware of? Um, maybe I think people who don't live in Costa Rica or haven't been here a lot, uh, they might think that the climate is different in Guanacaste, like different that it doesn't rain so much. And that because I've had some people that want to do like, uh houses like the mexican style that they don't have like the the eaves of the roofs yep. like really big and right here in guanacaste when it rains it rains sideways so yep. you basically have to have that like really take that into consideration that you have like to have like really good roofs and to protect your house because most of the living in guanacaste you want to have like outdoor living so if you have a house that doesn't have like a lot of protection from the rain then for half of the year, you won't be able to use it, basically. Yeah. So those are like the types of things that are really important about Guanacaste. Also, the water issue. Like even houses that have been built a while ago in coastal areas, if we have a very, very dry rainy season, then for the high season, which is December, January, that a lot of people come here on vacation and People who live in San Jose go to their beach houses or rent beach houses. So it's really full, all the beach towns. And in my experience, I've seen it happen at least maybe four times, both in New Year's Eve, like New Year's season and in Semana Santa season, yep. that water just runs out. So there's no water. So you have to pay for a tank of water to come to the houses and fill up uh, their tanks. So that's another thing that's super important in Guanacaste because that doesn't happen in San Jose. It only oh. happens in the coastal areas. So that's, uh, I can go back to the thing of reusing water, whether it be wastewater or rainwater or just have like the consciousness to incorporate some, some sort of water purification system so that you cannot, you can like help not affect the town itself yep. by using a lot of water and then coming in the high season or having a big house that sleeps 10 people in there. So it's 10 people flushing the toilets, taking showers, uh, doing everything. It's super important to keep that in mind because it well, is a real problem. I think that that goes back to finding a way to reuse your gray water. I mean, if you can find a way to do that, then theoretically, if the water goes out, you still have your toilets. You know, exactly. so where other people won't, you still have your toilets. Okay, you may not, um, you know, have water running from your 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 you know your taps, but at yeah. least you have your toilets. You know, which is um, you know it doesn't solve the issue, but it solves half the issue. Yeah, it solves half the issue, and also like keeping in mind when selecting something like the toilets or the faucets or the shower heads, everything to use low consumption because the older water tanks. For the toilets they consume like each time you flush uh they used to consume i think it was like from six to eight liters of water yep so it's just water that you're throwing away so now they have a lot of toilets that consume like one third of that or even yep. less so it's also like having the consciousness to to select those kinds of things they may be a little bit more expensive sometimes which is why people sometimes don't want them but yep. in, the, in the long run it's better for you, it's better for the environment, it's better for the place, like the community where you're building your house. So so yeah, in Guanacaste, I think that's one of the things that's most important. I think as you get older, you just realize is sometimes it's better just to pay for it upfront because in the long run, it's going to save you time and save you money. So yeah, but same with like the solar panels are the same thing. People like upfront, they're like, oh yeah, but my building, like the, all the construction is costing so much. Why am I gonna spend I don't know, a hundred thousand extra dollars to get solar panels to heat my water. Yep. Uh, but then in the long run, it's a very good investment because if not, you're paying much more in electricity to keep your water warm. 
Yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, let's change gears a little bit. I want to talk a little bit about Nasara and also Playa Grande. I know that you're very familiar with both uh, areas. Um, you know, Nasara is one of the you know most expensive areas in the country at the moment to develop. Uh, you know, Playa Guiones. But where do you think there is still you know opportunity to buy land that's not crazy priced around there? Okay, so I think if you go more. Um, towards Samara, like from Guiones towards Samara, all, all the, that like strip of space there that's not very populated. You have Garza that it's still just like a little fisherman town. It's like a really small town. You don't have big developments. So land there should be like a lot less expensive than in Guiones. Yep. But it has like the thing that there's not as much development as in Guiones. So you have to get in your car and drive longer to get to a restaurant, to the supermarket. So it has like pros and cons, but I do think like it's a nice area. And I think maybe like from Guiones, it's going to start expanding towards that size eventually. Yeah, yeah I agree. So I think towards that side is where you can get better. And maybe up in the mountains, if you don't have like ocean view, because if you do have ocean view, it's probably going to be more expensive than, than buying down in the town. But up in the mountains, it's really nice. You're close enough and it's probably a lot less expensive. Yeah, I agree. I know that you had a beachfront home in Playa Grande. Uh, so you're very familiar with that area. Myself and a lot of other people are like gung-ho on that area because it's beautiful. I mean, it's, you know, it's a national park. There's no, there's no bars on the beach. You know, it's just, it's a very tranquil place. But it reminds me a little bit of Nosara from the point of view of the surf the wellness, the national park, you know, it, and just how everything is laid out. I mean, where do you think Grande is going? I think Grande will not get to be as developed as Nosara in a national park. They have a lot of restrictions there. Actually, most of the houses a few years ago, the houses that were like, right, like you could go out from a gate to take a few steps and go out to the beach. Yep. Those houses lost a lot of their property a few years ago because the laws changed. Um, so they do protect it a lot. And the water issue is really big there also. So there's that. And there's, then there's the part like right when you get to Grande, there's a, a, like the develop not a development, but it's called Playa Grande Estates, like all the lots that have there. Yep. They, like uh, up until maybe mid last year they still had like really affordable prices it was a hundred and twenty five thousand dollars they're now at 175 which yeah. is still not bad there are two lots i think two lots at 179 actually yeah actually my two clients that i'm designing their houses there yep. um one is in las ventanas and the other one is in playa grande estates and they both bought their lots right before the prices like went really really higher wow. um and they're like Thank God I bought it when I bought it because right now I wouldn't be able to buy that same lot and they have like really good lots. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the prices have gone up and then they do limit construction a lot. Like they, which don't they should do, which is good, yeah, which is good. Do, so that's a good thing. So that's mainly why I think it won't get to be how it is in Nosara because you can't develop as much in a national park. True, true. But it's also but it's the really nice place. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, Las Ventanas is beautiful. I stayed there a couple of weeks back for a week with the kids and we had a great time. You know, they have that they have their like communal area up there, which nobody goes to. Um, you know, it's a quieter kind of neighborhood. The lots are kind of large, you know, beautiful views. It's kind of set back. So if you want to, you know, you can go to Tamarindo. If you don't, you can go down to Grande. Um, you know, it's just it's just a chilled beach town. Yeah, yeah. And they have like, a few small restaurants and now they have like a small gym there and they have yoga classes and so it's like a, the same vibe as Nosara actually yeah, yeah. It's the yeah. same vibe and actually when you go out to the beach you can see like right the part before you get to the beach and both beaches is mostly like the same and the color of the sand and the type of waves so they are really similar I think the big difference between them is that that Playa Grande will never get to be as developed as Nosara uh, which is a good thing because then it's yeah. like a different type of place if you want to live there. I agree. Let's just jump back into building in two seconds. What do you think of the mistakes that people make when they build here in Costa Rica and what would your advice be for them? Okay, so um, let me think a little bit on that one um, because there are like different types of mistakes. One of the biggest ones is like when they select the materials or when they 
like sometimes they select materials that are not really thought to be for outdoors at the beach, for example. Yep. So if if you select like you you see a photo and you say, oh, I want like these stones in in around the pool and to the backyard. But then when it's already built, if mostly their architect, if it if it were me, like I would suggest like don't use that because this and this would happen. But sometimes people are just yeah. set in their way. They say, I want how that looks. So I want that, whatever it is that you say, why I shouldn't, I want it. So sometimes it's like stones that get like really, really hot. So you're not able to go barefoot around the pool in a beach house. Yep. And things like that. It's like mostly people, mostly like people who come from another place, like from another country, they come here and they don't really know like. Yeah, I mean, I think it's about adapting to the environment here, um, just exactly. because it's it's very, very different. Um, yeah. And the products that we use here, you know, we use them for a reason here and they've probably been tested over <laughs> hundreds of years. So, um, yeah, and most recently, but just to jump, just to jump in, because I'm sure a lot of people ask, how much are architectural fees in Costa Rica? Okay, so architectural fees here vary a bit, like the Colegio de Arquitectos, which is the entity, like where we all have to be registered in there and everything. They have uh, a table with the minimum fees that architects can charge. But from there, it's like, it can go to anything you want. It's like what are, what like, are those minimum fees? I'm sure you don't charge the minimum fees, Michelle, because I know that you do great work, but what, what are the minimum fees? Do you know? Okay, yeah. So for getting pre-project, construction documents and engineering uh, plans as well, that only those it's six percent of the total cost of the construction that's okay. the minimum so i mean if the total cost of cost of construction was five hundred thousand dollars that would the minimum would be thirty thousand dollars for that yeah so okay where do you people, sorry most people like that's the minimum but most people charge less than the minimum sometimes. oh wow or they can do uh i've seen like a lot of people do like they lower the cost of the construction to get the percentage, yep. like say it's going to cost $500,000. I'll tell you like, okay, I'm going to help you out. And I'm let's say that the construction is going to cost 400,000 instead of 500,000. So that way I'm charging like the minimum and or whatever percentages that I want to charge yeah. and it won't be as expensive okay. for people. But so like most around. things in Costa Rica, creative is the word. So anyway, where do you believe the gap in the market is at the moment? Uh, Michelle, I mean, for anyone that's looking to invest or buy in Costa Rica, I mean, where do you believe the gap in the market is? Um, maybe in the like in the due diligence process. Like sometimes a lot of things get lost there. Like foreigners come here and they want to buy a property or buy something, and there is like as in every other place in the world, there's a lot of like really shady people that take advantage of people who come to, from a foreign country and don't know what they're doing or what they're getting into. I so spend I a lot of my gap. time, Michelle, having to clean that up sometimes yeah. or helping people go through that process so that they make sure that they go through the right thing. They get all the required paper, Absolutely. the water letter, the also swell, or make sure municipality taxes have been paid, you know, all this kind of stuff. Yeah, and make sure you can build in the property you buy yes. because sometimes there's uh, something like, a creek whatever it's something like, like a river that's really close by and then when you take like all the space that you need to take to build then you have like five percent of the lot that you originally bought so you're not going to be able to use it so all of that so i think there's still like there's people like you who do that um like help people with this but there's not that many people who do that no so I, a lot I, of people just hire like a lawyer right off the street that tells them oh i'll help you get everything done and they just don't advise them correctly and they end yeah. up like getting a property they can't even use. So you know, yeah. I, I had a client the other day that was looking at a property in Uvita. It was beautiful, um, but there was a huge cliff down to the river. And I was like, guys, I think that's a 50 meter setback. And they were like, no, 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 no. We've been told it's 15 meters. So, you know, I went to Imbu with the uh, plano and stuff and they were like, no, it's 50 meters. Um, you know, and that cut way, that cut through basically their ocean view. So they'd have to put their property on a non-ocean view part of it. Yeah, buying an ocean view lot, which doesn't make oh. any sense. But it was, yeah, some people just want to sell their lot, so they won't give them all the information. Yeah. So. And it was three hundred thousand dollars. I mean, three hundred thousand dollars for a non-ocean view lot. No, there was a lot of money to pay, and it wasn't that big. Oh, so, uh, yeah, exactly. 
If you don't mind me asking, Michelle, and feel free to just say I haven't, but like, what have you personally invested in and why? Uh, at this moment, I haven't invested in anything really, but I would really like to invest in land. Yep. Because what, I think uh, that is one of the best investments you can make. Yeah. So, okay. So here, everything is getting like better and more people are coming to live here and more people want to buy properties. So I think uh, investing in land is a very good investment. I agree. So if you inherited $500,000 and had to invest it in a business or real estate in Costa Rica, where would you, because it sounds like you would buy land if you had that money, um, <laughs> it's a loaded question, but where would you buy it and why? Wow. <laughs> $500,000. You can buy multiple bits of land, of course, with $500,000. Yeah. Um, which locations would you buy it in? I have like uh, mixed feelings on that one because I would definitely, um, coastal areas are definitely going up. So that would be a really, really good investment. Uh, come on, give us some locations because the <laughs> people listening to the podcast here want to know locations. Where would you, where would you personally invest? Okay. So if it were like an, just an investment to yep. make it grow and then make something out of it. So I would go towards maybe Playa Negra, Marbella, Ostiona, like all of those places that have not yet been very developed, but are really good. And they are all uh, surf beaches, which is always uh, uh, like a hook for different places that makes people want to go there. But they are not very developed at the moment. Also, Hunkijal yep. is one of the same. I was there so, yesterday. Yeah, <laughs> I was in Negra Hunkiao yesterday with some clients wow. looking to build a treehouse lodge. So oh, um, wow. just land is much cheaper there. You know, I mean, the piece of land yeah. that they were looking at was oh, like wow. 7000 square meters. It was one hundred and twenty thousand dollars. It had water, had electricity. You know that anywhere else would be four hundred. Yeah. You know? exactly. So. So, yeah, so those areas are and they are really nice. areas. Beautiful. Well. They're not very developed yet. They don't have like a lot of things to do, but they're going to they're gonna get there eventually. Yeah, I agree. Well, it's, without being overdeveloped. <laughs> well, I mean, Hunkiao has a road to it. You know, there was yeah. a lot. There was a lot that we were looking at yesterday. There were five lots, each of just over a thousand square meters. Um, you know, and it was like 45, 55, 65, 75 and 85, each one of them or the whole thing for 300,000. You know, it was just and like 300 meters from the ocean. Um, you know, so it was beautiful, but I, I agree. Those areas, you know, have great infrastructure. They have water. They're not overdeveloped. So you can get your water letter pretty easy and you can build. Exactly. You know, so, well, Michelle, we've taken up enough of your time. I really appreciate you coming on this. Anyone that wants to get in contact with Michelle, all of her contact details will be in the description um, and really appreciate your time, Michelle. Thank you very much for having me. No worries. Have a good evening. You too. Hey guys, another great podcast there. Remember, if you're looking for Michelle's help, all of her details are in the description below. Um, I know that the name of her business is a French name, um, so I'll put all the description, I'll put all, all of it in there. Um, but remember, Michelle Brutin, that's B-R-O-U-T-I-N. I uh, hope you enjoyed that podcast, guys. Very informative. You know, we went kind of all over the place there from, you know, design to sustainability to construction to Playa Grande, Nosara, Negra, Junquial. Um, so I hope that that was informative. Uh, remember, guys, if you would like me to cover any future podcasts, feel free to reach out to me. If you're looking to invest in Costa Rica, I think it'll probably be you'll find it very uh, rewarding just to spend kind of 15 20 minutes talking to me. Uh, I don't think anybody ever talks to me and goes, that was a waste of time. So, uh, but anyway, uh, you can get to listen to my craziness for a while. But um, remember, if you want to, you can email me directly, info at investingcostarica.com. That's info at investingcostarica.com. Um, and our next episode that we have coming up, we get Roberto Sfera uh, talking about interior design with a startup that he's currently working on called Pancake. Um, and we're also going to get some lawyers on to talk about closing costs as well in the future, guys. Uh, appreciate it. Have a good evening and I'll speak to you soon.